the youngest of four boys. I finally get a day alone with my dad. I hadn't seen him much because he'd been gone for a couple of years while we were in New York. And of course, I'm talking his head off. And he said, listen, I, I got to get this done. You, you have to go out. I went outside. And as I was walking out of the building, the producers were walking in. And they said, hey, are you seeing Tommy, the director? And I said, yeah. And they pulled me into their office. And uh, they convinced him to screen test me. And I did. And I got the job. I want to talk to you a little bit about your career and of course this event that you got coming up in Idaho Falls. Um, yeah. Let's go ahead and start with that. It's a Napoleon Dynamite 20th anniversary. Yeah. What's, what's this event going to be like? Well, you know, the thing is, there's something so special about this movie and, you know, we, we've mulled it over, you know, over the years because we've been doing these, these shows for a little while now and one, one of the things that seems to be consistent about this is that people um, people respond to the show the way they do because it, it really is such an inclusive and such a positive uh, uh, experience. I mean, I, I even had many actor friends when the movie first came out, particularly when it came out on DVD, who would call me and say, you know, I've never... I've never been able to sit with my kids and watch anything. They either hate what I'm watching or I hate what they're watching. And so this is the first movie that we actually were able to come together and watch. And I think a lot of people share that experience uh, with regard to this film. And and it's, it's inherently, I guess, you know, uh, familial. I mean, people really... Um, relate to it in such a way so when when they come to these shows we really do um, emphasize kind of this interaction we want to have interaction with them we like to hear the stories we like to to talk to people we love and, and we answer their questions and sure there's a lot of very straightforward kind of funny normal questions when we do q a but there's also some really interesting questions and there's always great stories but we we kind of goof around with them you know we we don't it's not just we're sitting there kind of uh you know in enjoying the attention we really we are the original fans of this movie we were when we were making this film we would quote these lines you know we would quote these lines as we were sitting around eating dinner you know your mom goes to college i mean like we would throw banner these lines around we didn't know that it would turn into the phenomenon that it has but but we but we certainly were fans of the film so when people are coming to celebrate the film we're not you know and sometimes they thank us for doing it but like thank us that we're we're thankful that we were able to be part of this film it's really jared hess who is the the man behind the curtain that's that's great i'm glad that you know after all these years people are still fans and you still get recognized for your role and and all of that now some actors are bugged that they're recognized for one role does that bug you at all with this or do you enjoy that not at all no not at all no in fact you know as i was saying uh i, I you know as i told the guys that i've told people i would never do this if it, if it was for some movie where let's just say you know it was a you know, uh, a very violent or, you know, uh, some kind of a film that people loved, but it was, but it, it didn't, it didn't have this kind of positivity and this kind of, uh, I don't know, there's just such a, a sense of optimism that comes from this movie, you know? Uh, and I just, I, I think that's really what has drawn me to the film. So, you know, look, if, if, if I get remembered for, for only one movie, I, I'm certainly proud to have it be this one. This movie, I know for people in Idaho, it's, I mean, another reason that people like it is because it, it was filmed in eastern Idaho, in our neck of the of woods here. Yeah. Um, you know, Preston's just a two-hour drive south of here. Um, yeah. had you, have, do you have any ties to Idaho at all? Well, I don't have necessarily familial ties, but I do, before I did the movie, I, I remember I, in, um, 
1999, I, you know, 2000, the year 2000 was coming. And I, you know, I know a lot of people were freaked out about the year 2000, but I just, you know, you knew that there was a sea change coming, at least with respect to technology. You know, you knew that things were going to be different. And I was on a hiatus. I was on a show called The Pretender on NBC. And I, you know, I had some, some, some downtime. I had a few months and I just, you know, rented a car and, and drove around the country. And I found spending a good amount of time in Idaho. Uh, I just, you know, I stopped and I, I, I loved Idaho Falls. I, I just, I don't know. I was just really into Idaho. I was into Lewiston up by Sandpoint. I just was into the state. So it's very interesting. And it's funny, my, my first girlfriend ever, my first love, she was a, she became a pretty big fashion model back in her day. And now she lives up in, in, uh, hope or new hope. Is it new hope or East hope? Maybe. Uh, I know. I, I mean, uh, not Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't, my, I had an aunt who lived in new hope, Pennsylvania. So she lives up in hope, which is, uh, Eastern Northeastern. Pennsylvania. I mean, uh, uh, Idaho, sorry. Idaho. Northeast Idaho. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And so, I mean, not to, not to harp too much on this Idaho tie, but I was looking through your IMDB, uh, list and you actually made a movie called Twin Falls, Idaho. Yeah. I, pr- I produced that film. Uh, I co-produced it, but I really put that, it's a long time ago and the, it was the Polish brothers, they're, they're, they were, yeah, you know, they still work here and there, but they were like the, the, the new faces and I put that whole movie together and put it with Rena Ronson and she, you know, financed it and and and, um, and it was a great little film and I, I yeah, I, I, we just, it's just always been a connection to Idaho, you know. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, John, I wanted to ask you, uh, I didn't realize your, your resume as an actor went back. Uh, I mean, you've been, you've been involved in a lot of projects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your, your acting career started back in like the eighties. Actually. Well, yeah. I mean, the truth is probably before that, because, um, when I was nine years old, uh, I, had knocked my tooth out and I, my father was a filmmaker. He passed away in 77 when I was 19 or 18. Uh, but he was making this film with Charlton Heston at Paramount. Oh, which, and which, so what was his name? His name was Tom Grise. And like, what are some of the films he made? Oh, he directed Helter Skelter. He directed, uh, uh, Charles Bronson in a couple of films. One was called Breakout. The other one was called Break Hard Pass, which he shot in Idaho. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and he created a show way, way back in the mid '60s called The Rat Patrol. And uh, he, you know, he'd been he did Helter Skelter. He'd, he'd won a few Emmy awards uh, throughout his career he died quite young he was 54 when he passed away but um so i i you know i was around uh you know he used to direct a lot of episodic television way way back in like the heyday of uh, you know episodic 60s television he did like you know batman and mission impossible and shows like that oh wow but my parents had been separated and my father was in LA and we were still in New York with my mom. And then we all moved out to Los Angeles and I, I had broken one of my front teeth and he had to take me to the dentist. And he told my mother, he's like, look, I'm not, I'm not going to bring him about out back to work because we were living up the coast on the beach. And he said, I, I got to go to work and I'm just gonna have to take him with me for the day. And he did. And, uh, you know, uh, he was finishing a rewrite on his screen, uh, his screenplay, which was a film called Will Penny that he was about to shoot with Charlton Heston. It turned out to be Charlton Heston's favorite role he ever played. He was quite good at it, actually. And, um, and it had Donald Pleasance and Bruce Dern and uh, uh, Ben Johnson. It had quite a good cast. And yeah, it was so a okay. Western. And I um, basically... My dad was like, I was, you know, the youngest of four boys. I finally get a day alone with my dad. I hadn't seen him much because he'd been gone for a couple of years while we were in New York. 
And of course, I'm talking his head off. And he said, listen, I, I got to get this done. You, you have to go out and and go, you know, play on the Western Street. There's nobody on it today. And so I said, OK. And I went outside. And as I was walking out of the building, the producers were walking in. And they said, hey, are you, are you, did you, were you just seeing Tommy, the director? And I said, yeah. And they pulled me into their office and started talking to me. And, you know, and then I real, then, then they realized that I was my dad's son. They, at first they thought I was a young actor coming to meet with him for the movie. And, uh, they convinced him to screen test me and, and, and I, I did. And I got the job. And after that, I got offered quite a few movies. I got offered a film called the Cowboys with John Wayne. I got offered the Reavers with Steve McQueen. I got off. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be just a regular kid because I wanted to be at home with my brothers and my family. It just didn't, didn't have any interest in doing that. And especially if, if my dad, you know, it was easier when my dad was directing because I got to be with my dad, you know, but it, it wasn't something that I was really, uh, even thinking about doing, you know, I just thought this is, this is so fun. And, and then the offers kept coming till I was about 13 years old and I turned everything down. I mean, my parents pretty much would have probably turned the stuff down, but they always would just give me the option to, 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 to you know, to state my claim about it, you know, or what, like how I felt about it. And I always was like, nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I wasn't interested. And so I, um, things, I guess, changed when I turned about 18. I decided I might as well. In fact, the girl that I was telling you who lives up in Hope, um, Idaho, was uh, she was a model. And she, I used to go visit her on the set when she would be doing commercials or photo shoots. And I was kind of like, oh, I could do this. I could probably not model, but I, I I've been around the camera. I could probably act, you know. So I decided I would give it a, a, a shot, and I started studying. And then, you know, my dad basically said, "I'm going to have you read for me to do a small." There's a small part I have in Helter Skelter. He said, "But I'm, if you get this job, if you read, if you show you can read, and, I'm, and I hire you, I don't ever want you to ask me for anything again. If you're going to be an actor, you're going to be an actor on your own merit, not on." You're not going to be hanging on my coattails, right, which I yeah. totally, totally appreciate it, you know? And then, of course, uh, I did the, I ended up getting the job and I did it with him and he died uh, about 18 months later. You got started back in the day, you know, John Wayne was around and Charlton Heston yeah. and some of these, you know, legendary actors. Do you have a favorite um, star that you've worked with over the years? Well, I have favorites that I wanted to work with. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I certainly wanted to. I bought, I, I'd always wanted to work with Jack Nicholson. He's, he's to me one of the the greats. But I worked I worked with Christopher Walken, and that was a lot of fun. We played brothers. But I would say Jennifer Coolidge is without a doubt probably one of my favorites. Uh, definitely, probably the top. Uh, Garrett Morris is an actor who was on Saturday Night Live. He was one of the original, not for primetime. And we just, we've done a, a bunch of smaller things we together and we just have really enjoyed working with each other. One of your latest credits, you're in a podcast series. A podcast series. Uh, what was it called again? Because there's about two of them that I've been asked to do. The Bystanders. Oh, the bystanders. Yes, yes. Jacqueline Hales is one of the writers. And she and I worked on a film called Unicorn City. And um, she has since moved into writing and producing. And so she had called me and said, hey, I would love for you to be on this, be, do this podcast with me. And and uh, it was a lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. That audio format is, I got a special place in my heart for that because I used to work in radio. And oh, yeah. What is it like? I mean, is it, it is it different working in an audio for, format? I mean, well, no, I love it. I love, you know, listen, the thing is, I'm just like you. I, I, you know, I love radio shows. And for me, I romanticize them. The, the podcast was a bit of a letdown in that they didn't really they, they didn't 
call me and ask me to like do like a radio show, which I thought that's what we were going to do. Um, you know, the show turned out really well, and, and it, it was I was pleased with it. But when, when I say the experience of doing it was not quite like what I met envisioned that it would be like a radio show, you know. I, 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 they, they had me on like a, a zoom call and I just, just did all my lines while they had an engineer, you know, and then they talked to me and say, well, so-and-so's lines are kind of like this. And sometimes they'd play something back for me to hear. So I could kind of hear what was being said. Uh, but they just wanted to get like variations of that same, you know, whatever line the way I decided to do my line reading and I, they just would say, hey, could you give us different reads, different stuff, you know, and then they would kind of call it all together, you know what I mean? Interesting. So it's so, it's not necessarily 100% clear. No, it's it just, it's, it's you know, you, you know, they, they're, they're more, they, it's almost as if you're playing the game of telephone because they know what the other person said or how the other person spoke. And then when you come up with your ideas off of reading the script that say, okay, that's really good. Do it that way. And then, but try it this way because they kind of back, the other person backed way down on this. They didn't really be aggressive. So don't, you know, like, because I don't, if I don't, you know, you know, acting is behavioral. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you're, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And if someone said thing to me a certain way, you know, when, when I'm reading it, it might be one way, but when I'm in there and the person is doing it with me, it'll be a totally different way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you, 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 you're always, your behavioral adjustment is based on what the other person is doing that makes you say what you say, the way you say it, you know? Yeah. For people who aren't familiar with this series, um, what is, you play a character named Z. What is this show about, Bystanders? Well, you know, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, um, it's kind of uh, a, um, what's I going to say? It's, it's kind of absurdist in its own way, you know? It's, it's like more like a, a bit like a play. And so it, it is like, there's a play by a guy named Luigi Pirandello years ago called uh, 16 Characters in Search of a Play. I think it's called six, maybe 16, I can't, 12 characters maybe in search of a play. And it's about a bunch of characters who are caught in this weird like time warp looking for what they're supposed to be doing, waiting for the author to kind of give them a play. And, and I, to me, that's what this show seemed like to me. It was, you know, it was, uh, it was a kind of slightly absurdist, but it's a, it's a, there's a mystery involved and it's, it's just finding out how certain, a certain episode, which I don't want to give away was, uh, was, um, happened and who was involved with it. It's kind of a whodunit. Yeah, okay, so what's a, a project you have coming up that people can watch for? Well, there's a show that I particularly love. I, I will say that uh, but everything I've ever done, this particular show gives me probably equal satisfaction to Napoleon Dynamite, equal satisfaction to Real Genius or White Lotus, and it's a show called Dream Corp LLC. Okay. Which is originally was an original. Uh, it was an Adult Swim show, so you know that's like the Cartoon Network at night. But it's not a it's not a cartoon. It's a live action show, and an incredible cast, and incredible writing, and groundbreaking. I mean, when we we've had you know the the problem with Adult Swim is they don't really like to promote their show. They have kind of a built in audience on their network. And they are not really interested in expanding it. They they are they they kind of it, it, strangely it's the strangest thing you could ever imagine. But they for years. I mean now I'm sure it's going to be different because Warner Brothers has bought them. But but for years they had a formula that worked and that kept them in the black. And they they had one of the best. You know their their audience where a lot of networks were their their demographics were diminishing uh adult swim just kind of held firm they held strong and they were doing really well and they've always done really well and uh and it's just kind of a set audience and they're not 
pushing to expand. And so some shows kind of fly under the radar. Rick and Morty is an exception, you know. Uh, Rick and Morty is a cartoon, but it's it's a brilliant cartoon. And the person who used to work at Adult Swim, and this is Tales Out of School, I imagine, put one of the episodes on YouTube, uh, much to the chagrin of the network. I mean, it's you, you're, it sounds like I'm making this up because when I heard this, I felt the same exact way I imagine you probably are. It's like, what network would not want to become more and more popular? Yeah. What network would not want their shows to be hits? But, but the way their formula is set, they had their they had their demographic and they held their demographic, and they because they were able to hold their demographic in the zone they were, they were able to get these shows made without having to pay more money than they wanted to pay. So they could keep things kind of low budget and 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 janky, you know. Yeah. It just so happened this show, Dream Corp, was was the most expensive show on the network and it showed it was beautiful it's a beautiful show so it looks like that show ended in 2020 has it is it going to come back or is it done well that's the, that's the, the really the sixty four thousand dollar question because we've never received a letter that the show was canceled we've never been told we are canceled we are just interesting I, I, and i don't know i mean you know Maybe somebody's collecting money from insurance on it. I don't know. I'm not going to say. I don't know. But uh, but there's a reason why it's not canceled. And I don't believe there's any intent for the network to pick the show up. It's certainly not Adult Swim because they have a deal. It's on Hulu now at this point. And um, who knows? Who knows? I mean, it, this is a tricky, tricky business when it comes to that world, you know? Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So we, and so I would love for them, somebody to, to revitalize the show. You know, Mark Prosh, who's on that show, what, what we do in the shadows, he's like the, the best actor. I mean, you know, they're, they're all really good, but to me, his, his character is the best character on that show. Uh, and, um, and you know, he's, he's got a following and he's great and he's so good on our show and he wants, you know, he wants to come back and do our show too. And Nick Rutherford, who's also a wonderful actor, but he's also writing for Rick and Morty and Ahmed Barucha. It's just a great show. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to check that out. You've, you've, no, it's, wor- it's well worth it. It's well worth it. Um, John, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thanks this so much for taking some time with me. Um, anything else you want to add about this this upcoming event in Idaho Falls? It just seems to be that what has really astounded us is that the response to the shows have been so really just enormous and warm, and and it's just been such a joy. We love to do it. We love love getting in there and hanging out with the people basically and talking to them. And, you know, we get into the audience. We don't stand up on stage to our Q and a, we wander around with our mics. We talk to them, we, you know, we, we, we do little, little events based on the movie along the way. We have some, not a huge cachet of prizes, but we have prizes for people who do special or safe, funny things, you know, 